we went to uh, Columbia on the weekend of Mother's Day in 1984 uh, for an interview. Um, I had maybe been to South Carolina once before in my life. I was an associate pastor doing youth ministry in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And the connection was made through a friend of mine from seminary who was a pastor in the presbytery. And I think uh, he was doing a wedding at Westminster and he told Ron Jacobs, I have this friend. And if you can get past the fact that he's a Yankee, you might really like him. <laughs> uh, and it kind of turned out that way. We went for the weekend. It was uh, the weather was perfect. Uh, I, of course, had no idea what summer in Columbia, South Carolina was going to be like, <laughs> but uh, I felt a powerful sense of calling, uh, as did the committee. And uh, the Monday after I left, they called and essentially extended a call to me. And uh, we moved there when our children were, he Josh was heading into first grade. And uh, Sarah was three years younger than he was. I have to say this from day one, Westminster embraced uh, our children and just loved them as um, as consistently and uh, in real ways, um, not in ways that spoiled them at all, but in ways that um, made them feel loved and cared for and a part of a Christian community. So, um, you know, I really give Westminster a lot of credit for the faith as adults that Josh and Sarah Jones both have and possess. Sarah Blossick is her name now, and she actually was in my church here in uh, Nashville. Josh is uh, an elder at First Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, where he lives with his family. They both have just the fondest memories of the seven years that they grew up uh, in Columbia, but especially at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Um, in 1986 as well, shortly after that, we were approached, the church was by the session of the McGregor Presbyterian Church. And they had lost their pastor asking us if we would consider merging with them, which would involve selling the property on Broad River Road. And I guess I was dumb enough to uh, think, should we ask this question, could this be a Holy Spirit thing? Uh, it really energized the church. It divided the congregation. Um, we took a vote on it, and uh, I'll never forget that meeting. Uh, everybody was there, and uh, uh, I thought this could be the end of my ministry, <laughs> but it, it wasn't. As soon as the vote happened, uh, everybody pulled back together and said, okay, we have this problem, and the problem was a good problem. The church was packed. We had a very small sanctuary. I'm guessing the official fire department uh, seating capacity was 150, and we'd have anywhere from 200 to 240 people at the 11 o'clock service. People were, you know, chairs were coming in the aisle and chairs were back in those closets in the back of the room. I think that what people were unified on was if we're going to stay here, we need to create space for the congregation to grow. And um, uh, so we, we built, uh, we had a capital campaign um, in 1987, I believe it was. Everybody contributed to it. I mean, it was widely embraced. But a lot of people uh, gave beyond what they ever thought they would. And there was a powerful sense of everybody coming together around that, that goal. And that was, that was exciting. It was uh, a privilege to be a part of that. Um, and building the sanctuary is something I'll always remember. It was, uh, it was fun. The congregation grew uh, in those years. Those were good years, you know, for Presbyterians in South Carolina. 
Uh, I think the cultural context isn't nearly as friendly now to mainline church as it was then. So I'm not I'm not t- saying that I am the reason they grew because I, I know there were lots there. There were good wins where you, you know, could could move your boat forward. But, um, you know, they had I don't think they realized how much they had to offer as a community of faith. And maybe the one thing I brought to them was um, I, I was amazed at how special a a congregation they were. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, ambition is um, is a complicated thing. You know, you don't want a pastor without it, but it can be also very unhealthy and born of um, the culture rather than the gospel. And I admit that I was ambitious for Westminster for good reasons and for bad reasons. I'll just say that. But the church grew. Um, I think when I came, we were 624 members. And uh, seven years later, we were 1,158 members. Um, Lots of baptisms, lots of new members. Um, We never had enough money the whole time I was there to do what um, what we wanted to do. And that's kind of a nice place to be as a church because you realize there are things more important than money that make a church um, a vibrant, uh, attractive, loving community um, centered in the gospel. So um, at any rate, that, that was a big deal, um, building the sanctuary. Um, It wasn't long after that, that at the uh, tender age of 34, I had a heart attack. And uh, that was kind of shocking to me. And uh, probably probably a function of how little perspective I had on myself. Um, Going through heart rehab was a really valuable thing for me because I learned a lot about that ambition and um, the unhealthy sides of it. But gosh, they couldn't have been more supportive, again, of of our whole family than they were during that time. And uh, I've been very healthy ever since uh, in terms of my heart because of um, how all that unfolded and the support I had from uh, the session and the congregation. Westminster um, taught me so much about how to be a pastor. Uh, I am so indebted to the Westminster congregation and the wonderful people who, um, who lead it. I would say that uh, the gospel's not about success. The gospel's about faithfulness. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure Westminster still has a vital mission and they're witnesses to the power of the gospel. I also know um, my wife used to say when my last couple years in Nashville, even though kind of all the outward signs were good uh, for the first time in my ministry of 40 years in four congregations, attendance at worship was declining. It wasn't dramatic, but it was declining. And giving had flattened out and membership growth was minuscule where it had been more dynamic. And one day, uh, Connie said to me, Todd, you have to realize um, this culture has changed and church is out of style in America. (laughs) And uh, I kind of have laughed about that. Um, I mean, in some ways that sounds so silly. Or, or glib, but uh, in other ways, there's a profound truth behind it. Um, church is definitely against the culture. Uh, the commitment of a Sunday uh, to something as frivolous as worship is not what um, is happening in great numbers in America now. I mean, all the statistics say we're becoming more and more secular as a culture. And uh, that's a different kind of calling for the church. I think it's harder to be church now 
I, I hope you heard me say that, that 84 to 91, my years, those were good years to be church in Columbia, South Carolina. They're not as easy now. I mean, the culture's changed, which says to me it's more important than ever for churches to keep preaching the gospel, to keep remembering the Sabbath, to keep it holy, to keep um, being folks who are focused not on yourselves, but on the community around you, because that's the call of Christ and the call of the gospel. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, who said, when Christians are faithful, they are always odd, meaning different than the culture around them. I'm not sure we had to be that in Columbia in 1984. You know, all the prevailing cultural winds went in the church's favor. I mean, Columbia is the Bible belt. It was then. Um, I don't think there's any place in America now that is. I think the Bible belt's unbuckled. And, uh, and I think that we've become a far more secular and less um, reverent, less Christ-centered people, which says to me, um, the church needs Westminster Presbyterian Church. The world needs Westminster Presbyterian Church. Columbia, Dutch Fork, St. Andrews needs Westminster Presbyterian Church to be themselves more now than ever. The gospel's never been about success. It's about faithfulness.